5,000 years ago, it may seem incredible, but our land-loving ancestors decided to leave the land and to head out over this, where they didn't know where they were going or what they were going to find. But I suppose we've always been, as a species, one that likes to look beyond, to go over the horizon, to go up the mountain, and in our own generation, get to the moon. But what we're going to be looking at in this journey is something completely different. They're heading into the remote Pacific, the biggest ocean on Earth, and they're trying to find tiny little islands. It really is the needle in the haystack. This is Indonesia, Southeast Asia, a major travel hub like a tropical Heathrow for us, Homo sapiens. 60,000 years ago, the first modern humans reached here. 30,000 years ago, they settled the islands off New Guinea. 10,000 years ago, they were starting to farm. And 4,000 years ago, they took to the sea. People have been coming and going ever since. But life has always been centered on the community, the village, raising crops and animals, harvesting and traveling the sea. Since modern people first appeared 200,000 years ago, most of the world had been explored on foot. Only the small Pacific islands remained to be settled. Three and a half thousand years ago, they were ready. The people of Southeast Asia were great sailors, learning their craft in sight of land. But by now they had developed their small fishing boats into vast double-hulled vessels, canoes that were strong enough to ride the open seas for days at a time, filled with people, animals, and crops. Leaving Southeast Asia, they made their way through the island chains, landing here in Fiji, 3,000 years ago. On arrival, they found these uninhabited islands covered in forest. There were no large mammals and limited plants to eat. Fish and shellfish from the lagoons were the main source of food. The ancient voyagers brought everything else with them. They are known as the Lapita people, after a site in New Caledonia where their highly decorated pottery was first discovered. The pottery is scattered like a trail of footprints across the southwest Pacific. This is the Singatoka site on Fiji's main island, Fitilevu. Great quantities of Lapita pottery have been found in ancient settlements buried under this three kilometer long dune. That's where we were excavating and managed to find a long... Uh, Sepeti Mata helped excavate the site 20 years ago. Goodness, there's all sorts of things here, That's isn't right. it? Yes. I can see the pottery too. All over the dunes were shards of pottery. This was what I had come to see, the thin, decorated pieces of clay that linked these settlements back to the people of Southeast Asia. Now, is this, um, is this Lapita? It's a later, uh, later Lapita um, pottery. Right, so, so it's towards the end of... Towards the end of the uh, Lapita. So that would be, what, 500 uh, uh, or...? 100 BC. 100 BC. Mm. So this would be 2,000 years old. Probably, yes. Now, People used this coast for several thousand years. The broken pieces of pottery show that. But why did they come and keep coming? Land hunger and the prestige for those who found new islands is the best explanation. So when the first people got here to this spot, what would they have seen, do you think? I think they, they saw a flat piece of land with a lot of uh, green vegetation enough for shelter and they can build their own uh, houses. The sea is there for them to do fishing and uh, there was 
enough sand and the clay nearby to make pottery, so they think, oh, it's a good place to live in. The Napita people turn the forest into a structured landscape with fields, houses, and even cemeteries. When the dunes were excavated, a hundred bodies were found in a burial ground dating back two and a half thousand years. But these weren't ordinary cemeteries. Most of the time, the legs were sort of uh, folded. Oh, yes. And also the arms, you can have arms like that, or arms on the stomach, mm. or just leaning sideways, and the legs. Most of the legs were tilted to one side. Right, right. But I was, yeah. I, I, yes, go on, show me, show me. How, how it, uh, Sometimes. Yes. Give me you, a lapita burial in progress. Yes. Somebody with one leg up, yes. or legs like that, and the arms twisted around like that. Right, right. No, it's all in very awkward uh, Awkward sort positions, of position, that's yeah. right, not natural positions. And yeah. three of the burials that we excavated in, 19, in 1987, mm. the skeletons were sitting up like that. Oh, so they dug them into a pit? Could have been. Yes. But it was, it was, it was, it was, it was the uh, skull was exposed on the uh, surface. We thought it was just uh, movement of the sand. But mm. when we started e excavating, and there you are. So as you went down and down and down yeah. to the sand, you really saw more of the bodies. <laughs> That's right. I've never excavated one like that. Well, All of was, mine have been lying no, flat. <laughs> it was really amazing. But Matta was in for a shock when he started to excavate what he thought was a bowl. Mm. I thought it was just uh, a buried uh, bowl, pottery mm -hmm. bowl. And when I came to the edge of the, uh, the bowl, I found there was a, a bone at inside, no, inside the bowl. Yes. So I started cleaning up, and there you are, a, a bowl on top of a skull, <laughs> and the rest of the bowl was stretched <laughs> out on the sand. The buried of a pot on his head. Yeah, must have but been. like my hat. That's right. <laughs> Just like a hat over the, somebody's head. That must have been fun to do. Oh, it was really fun, frightening too. Yeah. It was really frightening when you see him yeah. <laughs> laughing at you. <laughs> That's right, with the jaw slightly yeah. open. It seemed as though they wanted the dead to look animated. Intriguingly, most of the dead were buried facing west, the direction from where they had come. It was a great discovery, but Fiji had much more to reveal. The islands of Fiji are rich in tradition. Pottery is still made using techniques familiar to Lapita people 3,000 years ago. Mata had painstakingly reconstructed the work of those people. These pots were made by the first settlers on the islands. And this is Lapita. It's Lapita. This is about uh, 1,800. So almost 2,000 years old. Now, how did you know it was Lapita when you... Uh, whoops. Right. See that decorated rim? Yes, I see it that. Is, it's Lapita. That's, That's the giveaway. Yeah. They call it the late Lapita, but mm. you still... This slash design was one of the defining factors of a Lapita pot. You've whetted my appetite. I'm going to have to look in this one. OK. Oh, once again, look, the rim. It's mm -hmm. got a little slash decoration on it. The shape of the pot itself tells you it's a cooking vessel. It's nice even, good. look, this one's even got a bit of... Is that, what's, what's that? That's, is that cooking residue yeah, or something? Yeah, it's the uh, heat the inside the pot. Ah, oh, right, so that, that, that gives it away too. Right. Oh, neat. Not only did Mata have the pots, he had the tools that made them. Oh. There you are. Right, oh, so Wooden, this is... Uh, these are the paddles. Paddles, and that's the anvil. Oh, it's just a that's stone. a stone, yes. Can you show me how they're used, then? Sure. When the clay is still um, wet, workable, and then they have this inside. Yes. Inside the pot, and then the pedal, oh, and they... So you beat it against beat it the against. anvil. Right. And that gives you the shape. That's right. Rather than using your fingers. That's pretty skillful. Over thousands of years, potting has remained the same. The paddles and anvils create the basic structure. 
The decoration is up to the individual, but bound by tradition. The pots are then fired in an open-air kiln. And then glazed with tree resin. This pottery with its roots in a Lapita homeland to the west marks the first migration into the Pacific. Singing and dancing is all part of the process of reaffirming today's vibrant traditions. The village, the community, these lie at the core and always have. We take for granted the tropical islands of bananas and coconuts, but these were all part of the package brought into the Pacific 3,000 years ago. The package has been added to over the years as people have passed through the Fijian islands. The Pacific is divided into three areas, Micronesia, Melanesia, and Polynesia. The small islands, the dark islands, and the many islands. Fiji is in Melanesia. Melanesia and Polynesia, the dark islands and the many islands. We've had these terms since 1830, and they've been contested on many occasions, but there's a, a truth to them, which is that Melanesia the people are much more diverse the way they look than in Polynesia, where people are much more similar. And there's good reasons for that, because Melanesia has a much longer history. Those islands close to New Guinea were first occupied 30,000 years ago, and there have been many migrations coming into that area, going through that area, so that when people reach somewhere like here, Fiji, they're very diverse. They're coming from many areas, and the genetics and the archaeology is beginning to unravel that. So we end up with peoples here who are some of the most diverse on Earth today, as diverse as all the fruits and vegetables in this market, which have come from all parts of the world to give this very vibrant, alive culture that we know as Melanesia. But don't forget, the Melanesian, the differences are really only skin deep. The early Fijians lived in small, well-defined communities. As populations grew and inter-island travel increased, territory became more important and jealously guarded. They had a civilization they were prepared to fight and die for. Hill forts became a common feature of the landscape. Mata took me to the Tavuni Hill Fort. These are well constructed. Yeah. Walking up the hillside, we pass the remains of the old village. The higher we walked, the more sacred the area became. And the chief lived at the top. Oh, magnificent. If you look over to your left, there's the Sinotoga sand dunes up there. And the sea beyond. Yes, and the sea. From here, he could see his enemies coming for miles. I felt pretty safe up here. Before leaving Fiji, I had a theory I wanted to put to the test, and matter could help me. 200 years ago, Captain Cook noticed that many of the islands he visited used similar words. By gathering key words along my Polynesian journey, I hope to show how these Pacific people were still all closely linked. What about house? House in Fijian? Mm -hmm. Vale. Vale. V-A-L-E. Vale. I'm intrigued to find out whether this works, you know. So that's uh, house. Yep. Another very important word for this whole movement is boat. So what's the Fijian for boat? Wanda. By picking a few important words that are shared throughout the Pacific, like chief, land and boat, which incidentally I learnt was wa. I hoped I could match the movement of the language with the migration of the people. All the words. 
Thank you very much. I shall now find out what happens on the other islands. Fiji was only the first step in this great journey. The quest for new islands pushed people deeper into the Pacific. Without maps or complex navigation equipment, they set out to explore and then settle the more remote islands. They used the wind, currents and stars to find the way. Knowledge and experience made it all possible. In a few hundred years, they had worked their way east. About a thousand kilometers further into the Pacific, they discovered the islands of Samoa. I'm entering Polynesia, which literally means the many islands. Looking around at my fellow passengers, the differences are striking. I do seem to have crossed one of those geographical lines which determines the way people look, which is why in 1830, Melanesia and Polynesia were named. I'm off to the island of Savai. The first Europeans only landed here 250 years ago. Two and a half thousand years ago, the Lapita people had also settled on Samoa, leaving behind a few pieces of their distinctive pottery. But this is where my pottery trail ends. Instead of pots, I'm picking up the trail of the language and the lifestyle. The missionaries imposed a Christian Western culture. They stamped out cannibalism. But you only have to scratch the surface to find many of the older traditions still around. The market is a focal point of any community. The first people here were farmers. The coconuts, bananas, breadfruit, yams and taro that they brought with them are still the staple diet. These crops that we now so closely associate with the islands were only introduced a few thousand years ago, along with people. The only thing they didn't introduce was the fish. The first people not only brought plants and animals, but a ready-made culture. Hierarchy and a strict social structure is what gets things done in these small communities. This is a council meeting of the elders. Chief Malangi Jackson interpreted for me. I felt very honored because he was calling the gods to introduce me to the island. These meetings can last for hours, but are helped along by the ritual drink made up of ground-up kava root. Only a virgin can make such a brew. It's never going to replace a G and T for me, but after a few, we were nicely anaesthetized. No wonder the meetings could go on all day. In the quiet of her garden, Chief Malangi Jackson told me more about her ancestors, the great voyagers who explored the Pacific thousands of years before the Europeans. We always believed that the Samoans were navigators uh, to go out to find new ideas and uh, new, new knowledge. Why do you think they left? Why do you think they went on the voyages? Because they believe that uh, this is not the rest of the world. They believe that there is a much bigger world than just Samoa. And because uh, they believe in the universe, and uh, they believe in the stars. And at the time, they used to read the stars. And uh, sometimes they follow the stars. Fiji and Samoa are separated by a thousand kilometer stretch of sea. What effect did this distance have on the language? It was my chance to update my vocabulary list. Just some key words for what we're looking at, which is how the world was first peopled. For example, boat. Now in Fiji, it's waha, 
And in Samoan, what would that be? Fa. V A break A. Like that. Mm. Fa. Va. 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 <laughs> yeah, almost. Va. <laughs> Va. <laughs> so that's boat. Well, I'm doing quite well. Now, what else have I got? Ah, yes. This is a good one. I have land. As in where you live. Land. Fanoa. Fanoa. F A N U A. Fanoa. 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 Good. Even with my bad accent, the words were very similar, matching almost exactly with the Fijian. Some aspects of Samoan life haven't changed that much. Now, the archaeology of Samoa largely remains to be dug up, but some clues to the original community were all around me. Here on the island, everyone supports everybody else. Feasting is a communal effort. These earth ovens, called umus, are often found in the archaeological sites, remnants of their ancient feasts. The menu was probably pretty much the same as well. The coconut now grows in abundance. The pigs and chickens brought from Southeast Asia. The fish provides a vital source of protein. and the breadfruit and taro, the standard carbohydrate. It's a very healthy diet. And apart from the wristwatch, this scene is timeless. The trail of these people into the Pacific is not confined to their diet and politics. Tattooing is a symbol of courage and strength, as well as an art form. You need to be very brave to go through the process. This woman passed out from the pain after 10 minutes. Throughout the world, the human story is often told in song. And this song is the story of the women who brought the art of tattooing from the island of Fiji. The first European explorers were terrified by these painted people, mistaking the intricate tattoos for clothing. The patterns reminded me of the designs on the Lapita pottery. It's not something I fancied trying. Instead, I put my strength and courage to the test by going fishing with the boys. I'm not sure these boats were built for people like me, but staying inside the reef, we weren't hitting the high seas, so I felt relatively safe. The waters of the lagoon are filled with fish, the main source of protein since people first arrived. And in the end, our fishing trip took place in very shallow waters. While the expert got to work, I was left minding the boat. Although Erwini was an experienced fisherman, I think I had asked him to take me out at the wrong time of day. Try as he might, there was nothing around. He did suggest that dawn and dusk were much better times to fish. Eventually success, well, sort of. There is a strong bond between the Polynesians and the sea. It was becoming less and less surprising that they kept venturing further into the Pacific. So I'm off to the Cook Islands, from where some of the greatest sea voyages were made. To find out why, with no land in sight, they felt the urge to move on. A new day and a new island, Rarotonga. What a welcome.
Rarotonga is the largest of the Cook Islands. The first Polynesians made it here 500 years after reaching Samoa. As in Fiji and Samoa, the people share a common cultural and genetic heritage, but each island has its own unique touch. Here, it's tourism. I've traveled 1,600 kilometers further out into the Pacific. This was the crossroads for most of the travel done into the deepest parts of the ocean. Routes leading to Hawaii, 4,000 kilometers to the north, Easter Island, 5,500 kilometers to the east, and New Zealand, 3,000 kilometers to the south. These were incredible journeys across vast expanses of empty sea. Once the explorers had found new islands, they charted their route and returned to their homelands to stock their boats with everything needed for colonization. On Rarotonga, I met Sir Tom Davis, former prime minister of the Cook Islands. Sir Tom recreated many of the epic journeys using replica canoes that he had designed and built himself. So these are planks, are they? They're planked. All the canoes of this size, any canoe greater than 40, 50 feet, uh, you must build them of planks. Mm. And people still insist, because they're called canoes, of building them out of big trees. And uh, those big trees exist only in New Zealand and, and Canada. This is a, a moderate-sized voyaging canoe, but she is faithful to the design used here, Tahiti, and around the Tahitian islands. Uh, she follows the basic requirements of a voyaging canoe in that it consists of three parts, each hull. There's the hull itself, the two covered ends, and the raised midsection. Mm. If you don't have those three basics, it's not a voyaging canoe. Mm. These boats traveled at tremendous speeds, cutting through the waves like a knife. When Sir Tom sailed this boat to Hawaii six years ago, his modern support ship had trouble keeping up. Sometimes you think you're going very slowly because she throws very little water. The wake she makes is very small. And you think you're not going very fast. Then when you come to tot up the day's run, it's, uh, it's over 200 miles. These ancient mariners also knew their limits. They timed their journeys perfectly to prevent the onset of scurvy and possible death. The Europeans might have thought they were good sailors, but these islanders really knew their stuff. It takes 13 weeks to develop scurvy, uh, the worst conditions. Uh, th these voyages, none of them were more than 20 days at the most. So there was always fresh supplies always, always on fresh land? Always fresh supplies, uh, and that's way below 13 weeks or thereabouts. And of course the food they took was, uh, was very much uh, nutritious, and uh, they added fruits, of course, and provisioning was not a great difficulty. And so if you're only out for a short time, like, or well, comparatively short time, then water isn't a problem either. Water you can store problem. quite a lot. We, we sailed from, uh, from Hawaii to here, and that's 2,600 nautical miles. Uh, and uh, we arrived with still plenty of water. And this is water stored in goods? We, we, no, we store, well, of course, well, in the modern day, uh, we, st we stored them in 20-litre in, uh, plastic cans, uh, uh, which was good. We just numbered them, so we always knew how much was left. Mm -hmm. Did you ever try catching the rainwater as it came down? Oh, of course, we always do. But that's not the way to get water, because how many times have I watched uh, the rain squall go right past just 10 feet from the boat and go on and we never got a drop. That's right, hanging out with your cup. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Never got a drop, uh, so you can't depend on it. And then when it does come, it's short-lived, very heavy. By the time you put everything up, it's gone. The first great navigators had food, water, and well-crafted boats. I had started the journey wondering how these people had even attempted these incredible voyages. But now I was beginning to see why they were such confident sailors. The Polynesians harnessed the winds and currents. They knew when the right weather patterns would be to ensure a faster passage. To these first travelers, 
The journeys they made were no different to us setting off in a car. The Pacific Ocean was the highway of my ancestors, and they navigated with stars, with the sun, with the moon, with the sea life, with the whales and the dolphins at sea. Doris, a village chief, was one of Sir Tom's crew on his epic sea journeys. Back in 1995, we sailed from here to Tahiti to the Marquesas and to Hawaii, and we sailed directly back. It is not easy, but I believe for my ancestors, and that's why I went on that trip, to prove to myself mm. their courage and their knowledge and their huge and immense intelligence about sea voyaging. And for me, I believed that for them, voyaging on the ocean is probably similar to modern day man in a car traveling <laughs> on the motorway or whatever you might call it. Doris and the crew had made these voyages using the star formation of the Southern Cross to guide them. When we came back down south, we knew that as the waves moved southward and we were guided by the Southern Cross to come back here to Rarotonga, it was just incredible. But how accurate. But it wasn't just the Southern Cross, it was hand spans at the end of the Southern Cross. We went down five hand spans and we said that's where we're heading. And that's where Rarotonga was. That's where we came to. And Rarotonga means exactly that, under the Southern Cross. The people put their lives in a higher authority. No boat left on a voyage without a call to the gods. Tangaroi te titi. Tangaroi te tata. Eu, eu, i a mai ra. Te rangi e. Ki a tere atu te waka. Oru ki uta. Which means... The gods of Titi and the gods Tangaroi de Titi, Tangaroi de Tata. Eu, eu, open the heavens so that the canoe of Ru could sail to find the island to settle. I mean, that is just the beginning of a very long chant. I recognised one word in there, which was the word waka for waka. boat canoe. Yes. I've been noting down a few words, mm. and I just wonder whether I could ask you for a few of the Rarotongan words. Yes. And in fact, boat was my very first one, because in Fiji, the boat is uh, waha, mm -hmm. and in Samoa, it was waha, and in Rarotonga, it's waka. Waka. V a k a. So exactly. very similar. It's that link again between the language mm -hmm. as we go round Polynesia, which gives us an idea of how quickly it was settled, but it was settled by a single people passing on these traditions. You will find mountains on this island with the same names as in Tahiti, with the same names in Hawaii, with the same names in Aotearoa, which is New Zealand. So that was how our ancestors kept the link. They kept the link through names. Names of marais, names of islands, names of mountains. It's not just the names that link the different islands. Tradition, culture and archaeology bond these people together. These seven stones mark where the ancient navigators left to undertake the next stage of the great Pacific voyage. Tradition has it that New Zealand was settled by seven canoes coming from the Cook Islands. And the genetic evidence now indicates that the tradition is correct. There are strong links in the genes of the Cook Islanders and the Maori. You can imagine this scene. They'd be feasting and singing, and the great canoes would set off there across the reef on one of the last great sea voyages to people the Pacific. This is where they landed, New Zealand, Aitearoa, the land of the long white cloud, the farthest island south in this vast ocean. Humans only reached here 800 years ago. The people who landed here couldn't have been aware they were ending the great human journey that started 200,000 years ago in Africa and filled up the world. But New Zealand wasn't found by chance. People had sailed south and charted the seas, returning a few hundred years later to colonize the land. It must have been a bit of a shock for the Polynesians. Freezing winters meant life had to change considerably. 
Many of the plants they brought couldn't grow in these temperatures. Only the sweet potato survived. Seasons meant planning, storage and a need for a varied annual diet. The first people found no land mammals on these two great islands. New Zealand was, however, home to some vast birds like the moa and the giant eagle. But the new predator humans quickly hunted them to extinction. The first New Zealanders, the Maoris, settled the islands and coasts first. They turned to the sea for much of their diet. Here at Opateri on the east coast of the North Island, I joined Louise Furry and her two children to do some archaeological beachcombing. So what's the name of the midden? What Louise had really brought me to see was a huge bank of shells. This is called a midden. The piles of shells and tools were discarded here by the first people who lived 800 years ago. This is what I call a shellfish processing camp. They would have come here in the summer, gathered all the shellfish from directly offshore, brought them onto the dunes and steamed them open, threaded them onto strips of flax and hung them up to dry. The shellfish in early summer are very fat, very juicy, very sweet, and that's the ideal time to collect them and to dry them for consumption during the winter. Oh, look at this. Shellfish weren't all they were after. They used all kinds of sea life, but not only for food, but for tools. Tucked under the dunes, Louise found an 800-year-old kitchen implement. Well, what's this in the middle? Fish scales. No. Now, it looks to me that there's quite a lot of damage around this edge yeah. of this tour tour yeah. shell. This is uh, something that, that I've found in these early sites before. Oh, yes, look. Look at the damage along there. And it looks like it's been used as a scraper to descale the fish. That's quite remarkable. The midden was a mine of ancient artifacts, proof that humans had made their home here in the dunes. Oh, now, ah. this is something interesting. Oh. This is volcanic glass, obsidian. Obsidian. Isn't that wonderful? Now, where does that come from? Where's the nearest source? The nearest source, well, there are two sources around this area. One of them is Mare Island offshore, which is the, just straight offshore from here, which is the main source of volcanic glass in New Zealand. And this piece is from Mare Island. If you hold it up to the light, it is green and transmitted light. And that's, that's unique to Mare Island? Yes, it is. And that dates back to the first people reaching New Zealand. They started exploiting and using these sources straight away. Every early site that we know of has Mare Island obsidian in it. And so what would they have used that for? Cutting tools. It has a very, very sharp edge on it. So it would be very good for, say, dismembering animals. Ah, right, so it's not so cutting much woodworking no. as cutting up those mowers. And... It, it is it's very sharp, but it's very brittle. Mm. And the edges break on it very easily. So you use a lot of that material. Once you start using it, it's got a high breakage that's rate. Right. Yeah, that's yes. right. You find large quantities of obsidian in archaeological sites. Food processing sites like this one were vital for survival in these climates. But as populations grew and land became more prized, gathering and storing food wasn't all they had to be worried about. Defense of their land was to become an equally important problem. Landing here in New Zealand, the first people dramatically changed their way of life. They cleared the forests, turning it into fields. But with only one harvest a year, food stocks became a closely guarded secret. The Maoris became fierce defenders behind the barricades of their fortified villages. In the middle of Auckland Bay is Brown Island, the site of one of these Maori forts. Perched on the rim of this crater, they were naturally defended. But the Maoris went one step further. 
Wooden palisades ring the ridge, protecting the village. You can still see the terraces cut into the hillsides today. They even created a rudimentary burglar alarm by covering the slopes with shells that crackled underfoot. The Polynesians had everything worked out from survival on these small islands to initial settling of the Pacific. Jeff Irwin believes that New Zealand was first discovered by an intrepid advance party of explorers. I think it's very likely, actually, that, um, that New Zealand had been discovered before it was colonised. In fact, I think most islands of Polynesia had been discovered first, because otherwise it would have been a hugely uneconomic venture to go out with canoes prepared for colonisation with men, women, children, all the pot plants and all the animals, if the chances of finding land were extremely low. I mean, the chances of finding New Zealand, Hawaii and Easter are really very small. And statistically, in order to have found them, you must have traversed a lot of empty ocean. So my feeling is that exploration went first, the notion of people exploring, finding, returning with sailing directions, mm. somebody going out a generation later, getting lost, other people going out. So for a couple of centuries, there was some toing and froing between here and the tropics. Then communications with the tropics stopped, and then the ancestors of the Maori were isolated. And then the voyaging stopped. The Maoris lost contact with their Pacific ancestors, but they retained their distinctive Pacific culture. They are still very much Polynesian. My last stop on this great journey was in Auckland, where amongst the trappings of modern commercial culture, the old traditions are carried on today. It seemed fitting that it was at the Marae, the meeting house at the center of the community, where my final questions would be answered. I hoped that Māori linguist Patu Hohepa could link all the pieces of the puzzle together, uniting the islands by their culture and language. He started by interpreting the murals. This is the fetching of the three baskets of knowledge. In it is agriculture, ocean, horticulture, hunting and gathering, a knowledge of incantations, prayers, uh, the raising of storms, the calming of the seas, and then the esoteric knowledge of the gods of creation of genealogies in the third basket. And everything in those baskets is contained here in the meeting yes. house, mm -hmm. in the form of the sculptures, mm -hmm. the genealogies, yeah. the traditions. Mm -hmm. All the way through. Polynesian yeah. history is written yeah. all over the walls of the Marae. The concept of having a chiefly house you find right through Polynesia. And the name Marae has spread right through even to Hawaii, to Samoa, Tonga, and even to Easter Island. So it is one of the concepts that spread wherever Polynesians went to. I've been, I've been making a little list here of words which uh, I've heard in the various islands we've been to. And I've got some of them here. I wonder if you could um, fill in perhaps a few. For example, very important word for boat. Yes. And in Fiji, this was... Wa'a. Wa'a. Mm -hmm. And in Samoa, uh, Samoa this becomes... Wa'a. And then in, in the Cook, islands, Tonga. Uh, ba'a, they use it. And, and the and word that you waka. use is, is waka. Waka. Mm -hmm. So waha down to waka. Waka. Mm -hmm. It's a very it's clear waka. link, isn't it? Yes, it is. If we pick common everyday words, you find that there is between a 70 to 90 percent um, shared sharing of cognates of words that are, are said differently but are actually the same word. It's, it's wonderful when you get different lines of evidence coming yes. together. Your linguistic evidence, mm -hmm. the genetic evidence, the archaeological evidence, which shows absolutely categorically that yes. the Pacific mm -hmm. uh, is colonised from the west yes. across to the mm -hmm. east. So the old idea of building rafts mm -hmm. in South America mm -hmm. yeah. and kind of getting on yeah. them and hoping the current yeah. will get mm -hmm. you into the Pacific uh, is not supported yeah. now by any no. evidence at all. No, it's not supported. Uh, we have to alter it slightly that it came from the Northwest. Mm. Uh, we were made in Taiwan. Yes. Southeast Asia was where the Polynesian journey had started. In 3,000 years, these great navigators had spread right through the Pacific. I had seen the people were linked by their culture, language, genetics, 
and archaeology. In completing these voyages, the whole world had now been peopled. A 200,000-year journey, which only ended 800 years ago. It's part of the human condition to expand and move when the social and technological climate is right. Reserve your seat now for the next great trip, the one to the stars. The long journey is over. People have now reached almost every habitable place on Earth. And all the evidence, linguistic, genetic, but above all, archaeological, points to the organization and forward thinking of these, our earliest ancestors. And their journeys defy simple common sense. They were never just pushed by the winds or drifting in the currents. Our ancestors did not people the world by mistake. They did it on purpose, for a raft of reasons, sure, and many of them too difficult to unravel, but leading back to Africa, so that a part of all of us is still very much African, however different those journeys superficially make us look today and act. Today, those same footsteps into the unknown seem incredible, journeys to the moon or beyond. And although technology limits us, I still think we need a reason to make it happen. And I'm not sure that that will ever happen in my lifetime, but when it does, I still think people will be asking, where do we come from by looking at the traces of where we've been?